Book Four, Francis the Hermit, Chapter Three, The True Disciple. Francis, with all these experiences in the spiritual life, was a good teacher and guide for his disciples. He taught them not to fear temptations. No one, he said, ought to consider himself a true servant of God who is not tried by many temptations and trials. Temptations overcome are a sort of betrothal ring God gives the soul. On other occasions, he turned back to his favorite conception of the demons as God's Guastaldi. Brother Bernard of Quintavalle, he declared, is visited by the most deceitful spirits of hell, who are trying to get him to fall like a star from heaven. Now he is oppressed and bowed down under their attack, but when death draws near, the storm will cease, and there will be a great peace. And so it happened. In the last days of his life, Brother Bernard's soul was quite separated from earthly things and he snatched his food in the air like swallows, said Brother Giles. And twenty or thirty days at a time, he wandered by himself on the highest mountain tops and contemplated the things that are above. But in his dying hour, he said to the assembled brothers, Not for one thousand worlds as beautiful as this would I have served any other master than my Lord Jesus Christ and beaming with very great gladness, he went into the eternal fatherland of all the saints. Another of the early disciples, Brother Rufino, was attacked by great temptations. It was with him as with the master. The old enemy whispered to his heart that he was not of the number of those who are destined to eternal life, and that all he did was therefore in vain. Yes, it even seemed to him that the Savior appeared to him and said, O brother Rufino, why trouble me with prayer and penance, since thou art not destined to eternal life? And believe thou me, for I well know whom I have chosen and predestined. And this so-called Francis, son of Peter Bernadone, is also among the condemned, and all who follow him will suffer forever in hell. Therefore seek no advice from him any more, and listen to him in nothing. Then was Brother Rufino all dark of soul, and he lost all faith in and love for his hitherto trusted master, and sat dark and alone in his cell, and would pray no longer, nor go to the brother's divine service. What good was it all? He looked for nothing else than the everlasting fire and the devil and his angels. It was in vain that Brother Maceo, at Francis's behest, took the message to Rufino to come. The unhappy man's answer sounded angry and short. What have I to do with Brother Francis? Then Francis went personally to get Brother Rufino out of his dark cloud. And already at a distance, Francis began to cry out, O Brother Rufino, thou miserable man! Whom hast thou believed? And he showed to him clearly that it was the devil and not Christ who had shown himself to him. But if the devil should again say to thee, Thou art lost, then answer him quietly, Open thy mouth and I will blow into it. And it will be a sign that it is the devil that when thou hast answered thus, he will fly away at once. And thou canst know by this that it has been the devil, because he has hardened thy heart against all good, which is precisely his doing. Whilst Christ, the Blessed One, never hardens a living man's heart, but makes it tender, as he says by the mouth of the prophet, I will take thy heart of stone from thee, and give thee a living heart instead. Then Brother Rufino saw how he had been deceived, and his heart softened in his breast, and he began to weep bitterly, and cast himself down before Francis, and once more gave himself into his master's care. Weeping but happy, strengthened and comforted, he arose, and when the devil again showed himself to him in the likeness of Christ, he answered him courageously as Francis had taught him. 
Then the devil was so furious that he at once went away, and with so great a blast and movement of the stones on Monte Subasio, for this happened up in Carceri, that they flew a long ways as one can see today. And while they were rolling down the ravines, they struck sparks, and Francis and the brothers came out in alarm to see what was going on. But Christ blessed Brother Rufino and restored to him such a spiritual joy and sweetness and exaltation of soul that day after day he was out of himself and entranced in God. And from that same hour he was so fixed in grace and so sure of his everlasting salvation that he became another man. And if he could have obtained permission for it, he would have given himself up to prayer and meditation on the things which are above. Wherefore Francis used to say that Brother Rufino was sanctified by Christ during his actual life, and that if only he himself would not hear it, he, Francis, would not hesitate to call him Saint Rufino, although he was yet living on the earth. In this environment of his faithful brothers living and conversing with them constantly, Francis forgot in the world remote peace of Rieti all that was upon the other side of the mountains. The brothers in Bologna, the brothers in Paris, the brothers at the Curia, and the brothers at the university, the brothers who were in all other places than just where Francis wanted them to be, and did all things differently than Francis wanted them to. As a counterpoise to it all, Francis issued a letter on the ideal Friar Minor, a letter which was not carved out of the air, but in which he employs traits of character of all his most faithful disciples. The perfect Friar Minor, said Francis, must be as true to poverty as Bernard of Quintavalle, simple and pure as Leo, chaste as Angelo, intelligent and eloquent by nature as Maceo. He must have a mind fixed on high like Giles. His prayer must be like that of Rufino, who always prays, and whether he wakes or sleeps, his mind is with God. He must be patient as Brother Juniper, strong in soul and body as John de Laudibus, loving as Roger of Todi, And like Brother Lucidus, he must not settle in any place. For when Brother Lucidus had been more than a month in one place and found that he was beginning to like it, then he would at once leave it, saying, Our home is in heaven. Francis rejoiced in being able to count in this flock of the most faithful others than those who were nearest him. Thus he once heard with great joy a priest returning from Spain speak of the Spanish Franciscans. Thy brothers, said the traveler, live there in a little hermitage and have so arranged things that one half of them spend the week taking care of the house while the other half give their time to prayer. The next week the two divisions change about. It so happened one day that the dinner bell rang and that one of the brothers did not come. As this was a day on which the food was unusually good, the others went in search of him. They found him prostrate, with face against the ground, with arms extended like a cross, apparently lifeless, completely carried away in an ecstasy. The brothers went silently away, and after some time the favored one came in. But as if nothing unusual had happened to him, he knelt down humbly and begged forgiveness because he came too late. Such an occurrence was exactly in harmony with Francis's wishes. I thank thee, O Lord, he cried out, because thou hast given me such brothers. And as he turned towards the quarter of the heavens where Spain lay, he blessed with a great sign of the cross his faithful and distant brothers. Such a pair of true Franciscans were also those two brothers who had gone to the pains of traversing the long road to the other side of Greccio to see Francis. Now it had become so in the last years of Francis's life that when he had withdrawn from the other brothers to pray in solitude, 
No one dared to approach him and disturb him, and the brothers took care of any business that might present itself. When the two pilgrims came, Francis had just gone, and it was uncertain when he would come back. The strangers who had no time to stay were much cast down by this and said to each other, This is on account of our sins. We are not worthy to be blessed by our father Francis. As they were so unhappy over the affair, the other brothers accompanied them on the road down from the convent, comforting them as well as they could. Suddenly, a cry from above was heard. The road went zigzag down from the lofty caves where the brothers lived, and as they turned around, they saw Francis standing up in the entrance of his cell. The two strange brothers fell upon their knees, and with faces turned to the master, received the blessings he gave them, with a large, slow sign of the cross. In the various descriptions of his life, are still preserved many a trait of Francis's fine feelings and tenderness for the brothers, and of his deep knowledge of the soul. He understood others so well because he understood himself, and the brothers often felt that he was reading their hearts. This was the case with one of his countrymen, Brother Leonard from Assisi. Weary of long walking, Francis had complied with the advice of a sympathizer and had mounted an ass and ridden a part of the way. Brother Leonard walked by his side, and presumably was also tired. In any event, he thought to himself, Why should Peter Bernadone's son ride, whilst I, who am of much better ancestry, have to walk? How surprised he was when Francis stopped his steed, dismounted, and said as he did so, It is not becoming, brother, that thou, who art of much better family than I, should walk while I ride. Red in the face, Leonard resisted his uncharitable thoughts and helped Francis to mount again. Against such and other trials and temptations, Francis over and over again advised his brothers to use three remedies. The first was prayer, the second was obedience such that one willingly did another's will. The third was evangelical joy in the Lord, which drives away all evil and dark thoughts. In these three precepts, Francis set the best example to his brothers. Ever since he resigned the leadership of the order, he always had a brother with him, whom he obeyed as his guardian. It mattered nothing to Francis who it was, he was as willing to obey the youngest novice in the order as Brother Bernard or Brother Peter of Catani. He was always pleased with his surroundings, and if anyone happened to do anything displeasing to him at any time, he would go apart and pray, until the natural irritation over the incident had subsided, and never spoke of it to anyone. Teach us to be perfectly obedient, the brothers asked him once, then Francis answered, Take a corpse and bring it where thou wilt. It makes no resistance, does not change its attitude, does not wish to move. If thou placest it on a throne, it looks down and not up. If thou dressest it in purple, it appears only paler than before. It is so with the really obedient. He never asks whither he is sent. He never is concerned as to how he came here, does not seek to be taken away. If he acquires honors, they only increase his humility, and the more he is praised, the more unworthy does he consider himself. Francis wished to be like a corpse, subject without resistance to all, and his true brother should follow him in this as in all other things. Per lo merito della santa obedienza, by the merit of holy obedience. Francis once made Brother Bernard stamp upon his mouth in punishment for some evil thoughts he had nourished about him. In one utterance of Francis, this conception of his obedience attains an almost Buddhistic character. Holy obedience, it says, annihilates all will of the body and flesh 
and causes a body to be dead to itself and ready to obey the soul and to obey its neighbor and makes a man subject to all men here in the world and not only to all men but also to all tame and wild beasts so that they can do with him what they will as power for this is given them by the lord this undeniably reminds us of sakyamuni's disciples who let themselves be torn to pieces by tigers rather than resist the evil and that this was not a momentary idea of francis which found expression in these words is seen in the tales of how he did not want to put out the fire that was burning his clothes and of how he upbraided himself for having taken a skin away from brother fire which it wished to eat the first great means of bringing about peace for francis was obedience taken as the complete abandonment of all personal will the perfect subjection to every command and every power if any one strikes thee on one cheek then offer him the other and if any one takes thy cloak from thee then do not keep thy habit from him and if any one takes thy property from thee ask it not again from him therefore if any one comes to me and does not hate his own body he cannot be my disciple for he who will save his life shall lose it but he who loses his life for my sake he shall save it the other means of obtaining peace was prayer constant and persevering prayer prayers without intermission francis himself as thomas of chelano says was not one who now and then prayed but his whole being was changed to prayer non tom orans quam oratio factus it was as if there was only a thin wall between him and eternity and he often as it were heard the sound of the eternal song of praise on the other side of the wall in such moments he suddenly became silent broke off the conversation if he was with the brothers and covered his face with his hood or at the least with his hands the disciples then would hear him sigh deeply and murmur something or other they would see him also nod his head as if he answered someone and they would steal away they knew that the master did not want to be noticed when he prayed it is told that the bishop of assisi once lost his voice as punishment for surprising francis at his prayers francis tried to conceal his piety as much as possible got up in the morning as quietly as possible before the others so as to escape remark and went out in the woods to be free from disturbance sometimes one of the brothers stole out after him and the curious one would sometimes see a great light and in this light christ mary and many angels would show themselves and would talk with brother francis when he at last came back from his prayers there was never anything to notice about him and he also used to say to his disciples when god's servant receives comfort from god in prayer he should before he ends his praying lift up his eyes to heaven and with folded hands say to god lord thou hast sent thy comfort and sweetness from heaven to me an unworthy sinner i give them back to thee again that thou mayest keep them for me and when he then returns to the brothers he must show himself the same poor sinner he is wont to be besides prayers in solitude francis also used zealously prayers in common with others in the fioretti we see him praying together with brother leo in his letter to the brothers assembled at the pentecost chapter he gives them rules for saying the prayers in their breviaries in spite of his physical weakness he never was willing to lean against a wall or partition when he chanted the psalms in company with the others if he was traveling and it was time to pray he stopped the requisite time if on horseback he dismounted when in december twelve twenty three he was on the journey home from rome he stood thus in a pouring rain and let himself get wet through as he prayed from his breviary to the end of the prescribed portion 
Does not the soul need a quiet time for eating as well as the body? He asked his companion, who remonstrated with him. Once he had carved a little cup in his leisure moments, and when it was just finished, it was time for saying the terse, the fourth of the canonical times of the day, it is set at nine o'clock in the morning. During the prayer, his eyes wandered contentedly to the completed work. Yes, so taken up with it was he that he hardly paid any attention to the psalms he was saying. Suddenly he realized his distraction, and in his zeal he seized the beaker that had taken his thoughts from God and threw it into the fire. Prayer was thus something which he took seriously. Christians are often profuse in promises to pray for each other, promises which are seldom kept. Francis was not like this. The abbot of the convent of St. Justin in Perugia had once recommended himself to Francis to be remembered in his prayers when taking leave of him. Francis regarded this as more than a phrase. He had gone only a few steps when he said to his companion, Let us pray for the abbot as we promised him. Above all, Francis loved to hear Mass every day. When he was stopped in a town, this was easy to do. Out in the hermitage it was otherwise. It is a long road from Carceri down to Assisi, or from Celle into Cortona. For Francis it was certainly the best Christmas present he ever received when Honorius III, in December 1224, permitted the friars minor to have their mass read out in the hermitage at an altar they could transport from place to place with them. After this, Francis had Brother Leo or Brother Benedict of Prato, who were both priests, say Mass for him. When neither of these was there, he would have at least the gospel of the day read aloud. This one of the brothers was glad to do just before midday. The third means for obtaining peace, which Francis pointed out to his disciples, was constant cheerfulness. Let those who belong to the devil hang their heads. We ought to be glad and rejoice in the Lord, said he. Melancholy was the sin of Babylon because it led back to the abandoned Babylon of the world. When the soul is troubled, lonely, and darkened, then it turns easily to the outer comfort and to the empty enjoyments of the world. Therefore Francis repeated over and over again the words of the Apostle, Rejoice always. He never wanted to see dark faces or sour visages. His brothers should not be mournful hypocrites, but glad children of light. To those who asked how this was possible, he answered, Spiritual joy arises from purity of heart and perseverance in prayer. Only sin and torpidity are able to extinguish or darken the light in the heart. When the soul is cold, said Francis, and gradually becomes untrue to grace, then it must be flesh and blood that are seeking their own. To keep free not only from every sin, but from every blemish, from every trespass, though ever so little, these were the conditions for living in the divine joy. The least grain of dust in the eye is enough to stop one from seeing the light. Francis taught his disciples to be on their guard against such grains of dust, and he especially warned them against confidential intercourse with women. When talking with persons of the opposite sex, he liked to look down on the earth or up into the sky, and when the conversation was too prolonged, he broke it off abruptly. At Bavonia, he and a brother were once entertained by a pair of pious women, a mother and her daughter and Francis in recompense had spoken some edifying words to them. Why dost thou not look at the pious young girl who hangs upon every word from thy lips? the brother asked Francis as they left the place. Why should one not be afraid to look upon the bride of Christ? answered Francis. Every pious woman in Francis's eyes was the betrothed of Christ to whom he, as the poor servant of Christ, did not dare to lift his eyes. 
In recompense for this complete renunciation, Francis accepted also perfect joy. There were times and hours when there was a perfect song within his soul, and he would begin at last to hum the melody he heard within himself. Hum it in French, as in the old days when he went out with Brother Giles to announce the gospel. Clearer and clearer would the melody sound to him, and stronger and stronger did it rise in him. Next he would snatch up a couple of pieces of wood or two boughs, place one to his chin as if it were a violin, and draw the other one across it as the bow is used in playing the violin. Louder and louder would he sing. More and more eagerly did he carry out his imitation playing, whose melody none but himself could hear, while he rhythmically rocked his body back and forth with the tune. Finally his feelings would overcome him, and letting the violin and bow fall, he would burst into scalding tears and sink into his own soul as into a great wave. End of Book 4, Chapter 3